Hello and welcome to another edition of the Workforce Connection. Every month the Workforce Connection brings to you the stories, the people, and the issues that are impacting the workforce in the greater Fall River area. The Workforce Connection is a production of the Fall River Area Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Bristol Community College, and Fall River Community Media. I'm Rob Mellion, I'm the host of the Workforce Connection, and this month's segment is going to be very interesting because we're talking about wind. And we're talking about wind technology, and we're going to talk about how it's going to impact the southeastern region of Massachusetts in a way that can potentially deal with the issue of energy production and help hopefully stabilize the cost of energy in the state of Massachusetts. To help me do this, we have brought in a wind specialist, and I said because he's been working on this issue for years. Uh, and the great thing is that we didn't have to go too far to find this individual. Uh, we have with us Paul Vigent, who is Interim Vice President of Workforce Development here at Bristol Community College. Thank you so much for coming in today, Paul. Hey, thanks for inviting me in. So I got a lot to talk with you today Let about uh, wind technology sure. and its area here, and or its impact to the area here. But the first question I got to ask, I thought that the Cape Wind project was done. I thought we were past this. Yeah, everybody kind of thinks that wind's dead, but um, the, and, and it's regrettable, the Cape Wind project tr at least got the ball rolling in the United States. We have to realize in Europe there are 3,000 windmills in the ocean generating electricity. In the United States, the first five are under construction right here off of Block Island. So uh, there is indeed uh, life after Cape Wind, and in, in fact, it's a more exciting opportunity than ever could have been imagined in Cape Wind. We're going to bring up a map here in a little while, and I'll start walking you through that. Why was Cape Wind stopped in the first place? Well, um, they started with when the feds didn't even have a permitting process. They picked a place that was convenient to the company to build uh, towers. It was shallow water, it was very close to shore. But when, when you kind of put that into context of geography, it was literally between Martha's Vineyard and Hyannis. So it was in an area where there's a lot of NIMBY, not in my backyard kind of reaction. It would have, it was considered by many visual pollution. Plus, you know, Ted Kennedy's house looked out over that sound, Walter Cronkite's house, the Koch brothers' house looked over that, uh, and uh, uh, the sound of Indian Sound. So it was just r right project, wrong place. And Maybe without a, a permitting too. process, they were the first one. So, you know, there was no permitting process. So they were pioneers in that respect. And every time they crossed the milestone, they get sued. So they ended up in court, endlessly in court. The projects we're going to talk about today are not that. They are of a different generation. They are of a different scale. And they are companies that are already financed and ready to go, which was always the challenge that Cape Wind got. While it was in court, it could never get its final financing. So that leads to the follow-up question, what's changed? Yeah, what's what, the big what, deal? What dynamics have changed that have opened up the door yeah. for not just more dialogue, but for action? Yeah, maybe if we could pull up the first slide here on the screen, it would give the uh, viewing audience an idea of what has everybody so excited. So this is the map of North America. And if you look at, it's color-coded, right? So red and orange and purple are the colors you really want to look at, because that's where it is windiest in North America. Well, tell you what, look at where it's windy as a bugger. It's windy as a bugger right off of uh, West Port Harbor, right? <laughs> About 15 miles south of Hosneck Beach. There's just this place in the world where it's windy and it is dynamic and it is a great opportunity to create this wind industry. In fact, if you go to the next slide, or actually, I'm going to go to the next slide for you. This is the zone I'm talking about. So in that box down there, they kind of refer to it. And if, if you, if you, the audience can kind of take on one point from this show, it's this is the story about the dog. Because if you look at that, it kind of looks like a sideways profile made out of Legos of a Scotty dog. But why it looks like a dog now instead of that big rectangle is because of good planning. The feds, by, by after Cape Wind's experience, the feds had created a, a planning process and a permitting process that required you to exclude zones where mammals and fish migrate and fisheries operate and, and shipping channels, sensitive areas of the ocean. Um, so you ended up with a subset of that big giant box, but that big giant box represents about 800 square miles. And in that box, believe it or not, is 22% of the U.S. wind energy, 20, uh, the whole of North America. 
And just think of a weather map, right? You're watching a weather map at home. If a storm comes from California, the Canada, the Gulf of Mexico, or Florida, when it hits New England, what's it do? It goes whipping past in the Long Island, goes whipping past Nantucket, you know, off the laboratory. Well, that's the place I'm kind of talking about. And in that zone, the federal government now has leased three tracks of that zone to these gigantic companies that are very experienced in wind in Europe. The first is a company called Dong. Kind of a comical name, but Dong stands for the Danish oil and natural gas company. The state of Denmark owns Dong. The state of Denmark naturalized their energy industry in the 70s and 80s. So in partnership with Goldman Sachs, when they were asked, when Dong was asked by the Boston Globe, how are you going to finance this project, which is always one of the killers in Cape Wind, yes. they responded literally by saying, we have 1.3 billion cash reserved for this project. So they're ready to go. Second company is called Offshore Wind Northwest. They're a subsidiary of a German company that is very, very well financed. It's backed by a group called the Blackstone Capital Group, which is the largest private mm -hmm. equity company in the world. With them, yes. And the third is uh, Deepwater Wind, and they're the company that is already financed to build the five towers off of uh, Block Island. And they have, again, very, very strong financial partners. So the leases have been issued, and the big trigger on this will be legislation that our own representative Pat Haddad has filed, which is so critical to triggering the industry. There's a bill that Pat has filed and will hopefully be up for review very soon in the legislature that will help set the Commonwealth's energy goals for the next 50 years. How much electricity does Massachusetts purchase that comes from renewable energy? And then the bill that Pat proposes, it's, it's really a combination package like the governor has been advocating. It includes Hydro-Quebec. It includes maybe expansion of the gas pipe that we're at the end of the gas line. So as a transition to all these other renewables, we really need more gas. Uh, but it also includes onshore uh, wind. It includes uh, land-based solar. And the uniqueness of Pills, uh, Pat's bill is that it also calls for 2,000 megawatts of offshore wind. That represents 200 towers. Now let me kind of draw a comparison. 2,000 megawatts is, um, is a little bigger than the Brayton Point power plant. And it's only 200 machines. And in this 800 square mile uh, zone that we saw on the map, you could probably build 2,000 machines. So, and it's renewable, and it's always there. So it's a very exciting opportunity that mm. very few people uh, understand very well because they're kind of thought, well, Cape Wind's dead, offshore wind's dead. Uh-uh, offshore wind's just starting off. Can we talk about why we need this? Well, sure. So, Brayton Point's coming offline, coal plants are coming offline, uh, the uh, Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant is offline. So, over the next uh, 10 years, 20 years, New England and Massachusetts is expected to lose about 30% of its current generating capacity. So, we need a plan to with fix that. With nothing to replace it. With, with nothing to replace it right now. So, that's part of the bill. It kind of says, how are we going to replace that, uh, those assets that are coming offline? Here's another great thing about this area, which I, I'm so excited about. When you start producing power offshore at that scale, you need a pretty big plug, right? You can't just build like some substation that's going to feed in. So, you know, perhaps there's an opportunity for Brayton Point as it goes through yeah, decommissioning to be to converted you. over that's, to be the place. That's exactly, that was the question when I was looking at the graphics that you had up there, and I'm looking at the location of the dog, and I, I saw for myself, I was saying my, to myself in looking at, you know, how could you connect the dog to Brayton Point? You, you connect it by a, Cables, a right? very long, expensive cable. So, so fr from point to point, from where uh, the Brayton Point station is out to these sites, which are about 20 miles offshore. that's really what offshore. you need. You just need an energy source, and you plug it into the power plant, and then that puts it into the grid. That's it. That's exactly right. And, uh, but to give you, an, give you an idea how expensive some of these projects are, that wire you're talking about costs about a million a mile. Right, so we're going to be about 20 miles offshore, and it's probably 20 miles from Newport up the channel to Brayton Point. So that's a $40 million wire, one wire. And because it's electrical generation, you don't just run one feed, you run a redundant I feed, you it, run two million, wires. Yes, so it's $80 get million dollars for two wires to yeah, just but plug you and this I have stuff in. On, you and I have worked on $200 million highway projects. For sure, for sure. So, but the point is that at scale, these are big devices the opportunity from a point of view of workforce, which is I think what you're really interested in, is like what's in it for us? Well, the, the first few towers will probably be built by the companies literally shipping these component parts over from Europe, from their supply chain. But that's not very uh, economic. So eventually, 
they're going to need to build this stuff in the United States. You already have TPI building wind blades in the uh, Tillotson complex at Baremco. Yes. Uh, the towers are very, very big. An intermediate section of a tower is probably like a seven-story building. So these are structures that you want to build and then roll off a ramp onto a barge and tow out to the site. I literally saw that happen when the Phillips Light O'Lear yeah. windmill yeah. was put together. The blades came in from barge down the Taunton River yep. and were moved onto the land uh, over at the uh, State Line Pier, yep. put onto the back of trucks, and then trucked up to Phillips Lair where they assembled it all. Yep, it, that is exactly right. So let me kind of give you something to think about now, right? So with the next generation of these turbines that they would be installing offshore here. And those were 191 foot turbines. Correct. Uh, actually, each propeller was about 191 Correct. feet. Correct, and they're even bigger. The next ones are even bigger. So the next generation of blades, you cannot transport over land. You cannot transport over rail. They're just too big. Now envision this. So you've got three blades on a propeller, right? Yes. Like the thing at Light of yes. On these new machines, if you took one of those blades and you put a 747 next to it, they would be the same wingspan. That's how big these puppies are. And again, take, and that's just one blade. Now, when you take the three blades assembled together and you superimpose them on Fenway Park, they touch the perimeter of Fenway Park. One set of three blades is as big as all of Fenway Park. So these are big devices, which is how now the Europeans have learned to get the price down. Because that was the other killer for Cape Wind. They were talking 22, 23 cents a kilowatt hour. We're paying 12 now. so. It was just very, very costly, and it wasn't competitively bid. The purchase power agreement that will result from this new development will be competitive bid, so those three companies will all be trying to get their pencil as sharp as they can so they can get that bid. Mm -hmm. And right now, the, those companies are delivering retail power in Europe at about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. And they expect with the new generation of That's machines, not they're going to drive it. That's far from what we pay here. It is not. And the next generation of machines, by the time yeah. they're installing these in three or four years, five years, that'll be down to 11 cents a kilowatt hour. It'll be cheaper than what we have right now, retail. We're going to go to break in a moment here. But before we go to break, can you talk about how Europe has shifted to alternative energy systems? Sure. Happy to. Please do. Let's do that oh, right do that now. Yeah, let's do oh, okay. it right now, and well, then we'll go to break. Know, one of the things is they've just, as Europeans, decided to get off carbon. They just don't want to be contributing to the carbon footprint any longer, and they've just made substantial federal investments to get into that. But here's the other thing. This, this I industry really started like in England and Scotland and Denmark and Germany, in part because they get their gas from Russia. So not only was it an ecological decision that the Europeans made, it was an energy security question, mm -hmm. right? If Putin gets up one day and decides to shut the pipe off to, to Europe, England gets very cold because they're at the end of the pipe. So it was really the combination of those public policy forces, the environmental community saying we want to get off carbon and here is a renewable, practical way to do that. And by the way, we'll be more in control of our own destiny because we won't be subject to foreign import of carbon-based fuels. So it's really that combination. And then the third combination is like a restaurant. Location, location, location. Y you kind of have to be where it's windy, and the windy place needs to be where there's electricity users. So one slide I'm going to bring next time I come is the night continental shot of North America. Because when you look at North America about 8.30 p.m., in the middle of the winter, East Coast time, so there's... Whole place lit up. Th there's a band of electricity from Boston to Washington. There's mm -hmm. a little bit of light around Chicago. Yeah. There's some around Miami. There's some in L.A. But the rest of North America is fundamentally dark. So even though the land-based assets that we have in the U.S. are out in New Mexico and Iowa and Wyoming, the downside is there aren't any people. There aren't any electricity users there. So when you look at this map, of, uh, of, uh, the, of the Massachusetts coast, and you, and you juxtapose that to where the heavy electricity use is, it's like, okay, I get it. And that's kind of, that's part of the story. Very interesting. We're gonna go to break. We have a public service announcement that we want to put forward. Now, when we come back, yep. I'd like to talk with you more about wind and address some of the, the issues that 
have impeded wind projects in the past. Sure. So please stay with us and we'll be right back after this public service announcement. This lab is for training folks to do weatherization work and they're building a what we call a test cabin. The primary purpose of it is to make it tight enough so we can do uh, building pressure testing on it. But it will also have a furnace and a water heater and a clothes dryer and an oven. And we're going to be able to teach duct testing, which is required by state code. I want to learn how to build a house and take it down from scratch, start to finish. But construction is like having a child, you know, like you do something wrong and it's going to impact the child. So you do something wrong building a house, the house is going to fall down. I think it's absolutely wonderful to give them a, an inside a building structure that they can actually create and see you know, how the buildings go together. Hopefully they will be interested enough in it to go on and, and uh, we need more young people doing this and doing it right. Hey, welcome back to the Workforce Connection. I'm Rob Million. I'm the CEO of the Forever Area Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And with me is Paul Vigent. And we are talking about the potential of wind energy being produced in southeastern Massachusetts. Yep. And throughout the first segment of the program, we were kind of introducing the idea of it, essentially saying that uh, while Cape Wind was the first attempt, now we're doing something much different and uh, very viable. And what I was curious about in listening in the first segment, Paul, is who is going to build these mega turbines? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, again, perhaps we can go back to the uh, PowerPoint. When you look at this picture here, it really tells the five or uh, say one, two, three, four, yeah, the five stages of of the industry growth. So right now we're really in the planning and development phase. So if you look way over on the right, the kind of jobs that people do are economists, lawyers, engineers, meteorologists, and project managers. But when you start getting into the design, the manufacturing, construction, installation, and operation and maintenance, you see that the job sets now become still engineers, but health and safety workers, iron workers, metal workers, millwrights, electricians, health and safety experts, marine operators, painters, pile drivers, crane operators, electricians. These are the people who build these devices. So what we're very excited about at Bristol Community College is partnering with the New Bedford Wind Energy Center, which is an organization that has tried to be the catalyst to bringing all of these disparate uh, organizations together, the federal and the state policymakers, the environmental community, the workforce system, the business community, doing the land use planning in our cities to get those sites ready, and really trying to build this infrastructure of stakeholders and partners that can advance this industry forward. It's, I'm, I'm excited about this, I mean, personally, and since I heard last year that uh, a group had been put together who was pushing this project and then had connected with uh, State Representative Pat Haddad uh, and helping to shape the Haddad Energy Bill. I, it, it's, it's it gets more exciting by the moment because I also know too the 10,000 megawatt gap that's coming. Oh yeah. I mean the Chamber's been uh, discussing this and uh, advocating about what we're going to do to address it for a couple of years now. Yeah, and it's a big problem. It's a very big problem. And to me, in listening, this sounds like a solution on many levels. You're talking about jobs. You're talking about this being a regional project, right. not a New Bedford project or a Fall right. River project. Yeah, the, well, the experience in Europe is very clear now. Initially, you think, OK, who am I going to compete with? And how am I going to get this? And but there's so much work that it'll be plenty to go around for a lot of people, one. But what the Europeans have come to understand is that, is just that point, is that you need multiple deployment points. You need multiple places where you make these uh, devices. And then you need still other ports uh, where you service. Because don't forget, this is a device is going to be out in a very harsh environment for about 30 years. So you need to go and fix that thing. You need to be able to paint it. You need to make sure it's, it's uh, functioning properly. 
So there's a huge uh, workforce that's associated with what's called the operation and maintenance uh, of these facilities, and those are great blue collar jobs that are perfect for you know residents of this area. And just out of curiosity, I mean, I know there's a number of programs uh, here at Bristol Community College, I and mean, you talked a little bit about it just a moment ago here, but how does this fit in with the the Workforce and Community Education Center at Bristol Community College? Yeah, so we already have been doing WIND training now uh, as a college since about 2006, 2007. Um, we offer uh, training that's workforce based that may not necessarily lead to a degree completion program uh, through the Workforce Center at the Wall Street. And again, we have a slide, if you can pull the next slide up on the screen, you'll see that this pipeline is really related to uh, the college's links with the vocational community system and is really designed to uh, pull together uh, the occupational skills, welding, electronics, but also a series of, of uh, industry credentials. Uh, OSHA is our safety organization. There are certain uh, uh, certifications you get when you're checked out to use power tools and operate safely in an environment. There are uh, certificates that MassPerg and the Mass Green Group offers that uh, recognize you as uh, having credentials and, and uh, competencies in the area of uh, energy sustainability. And we try to, at Bristol Community College, layer that with an opportunity to get a certificate that is a credit bearing certificate and ultimately if you do the whole associate's degree you would end up with an engineering degree with a concentration in sustainable energy and, and wind. So it's a pretty cool package. And when's the time that you should be starting this? Yeah, well, you know, uh, it, is, uh, it is time to look at the future. So if assuming past legislation uh, uh, is adopted in, in, the, in this legislative session, then probably within the next two to three years, you will start, well, I can say in the first year, you'll see these European firms seriously looking at locations to set up their U.S. production operations. What's happening in Rhode Island right it, now? It already is. It already is. So, hey, what's um, the project down in Block Island right now? Yeah, that's the one that Deep Water Wind is doing. It'll, it'll, uh, it has enough capacity. Those five towers can uh, br basically bring Block Island off the grid. So, um, now here's an example: the towers they're building five, right? So you can pull mm -hmm. it off at five, but those towers were built down the Gulf. So they had, to, they had to put them on a barge in, in Louisiana or Texas yes. and, sh and ship them up by barge. So I, I got to believe it's more cost effective to ship them from New Bedford or Fall River or <laughs> you, Providence you would think. than it is to ship them from Louisiana. So think. that's the kind of industry that will start looking seriously at the Northeast Atlantic for sites. And so our competition is really like New England as a group against Port of Newark. And then on the southern, per southern perimeter, you know, Charleston and Newport News, those, uh, those areas of uh, the East Coast um, uh, waterfront. So you, you talked about what's happening in England. You talked about what's happening in, uh, uh, throughout Europe uh, with many countries moving towards alternative systems. Yeah. We just discussed the uh, Rhode Island project that's uh, actually being assembled literally as we speak. Mm -hmm. Are there other projects across the country that we can look to to demonstrate that wind really is a reliable energy source that sure. we should be taking advantage of? Sure. You already have substantial number of wind farms, as I said uh, earlier, in the west and in the southwest. Uh, California, New Mexico, uh, Wyoming, and, and Idaho, uh, Iowa. Yeah. So it's, it's already been demonstrated in those areas that wind as a technology works um, and the European experience is the most advanced in the water, right? Because yep. they're the countries that 12, 13 years ago decided that the windiest places were offshore and that that was really the best places to put these machines because even today, some people get put off by the sight of a windmill tower. I kind of like it, but not everybody, you know, not everybody likes that kind of scene. So the beauty of offshore wind is that it's really you, offshore. You, you have to be looking hard to see and it's going to be like this little kind of dot on the ocean. You know, 25 miles offshore is a pretty, pretty good visual distance. So it solves a lot of the problem about, ooh, they're unsightly, I don't want to look at them, blah, blah, blah. blah. You bet, you, you, that just goes away. And that actually led to or leads to another question that a lot of people have. Are these things going to work? I mean, what about a 
we have hurricanes. Yeah. yeah. What happens in the hurricane? Yeah. So th this this when I heard this, it blew me away. The peak for the new the, the new generation machine, these big 10, 10 megawatt machines. The peak operating speed is seventy four miles an hour. That's one mile an hour shy of a hurricane category speed. one hurricane, yeah. right? So these machines are very, very robust machines. They like it when it's windy. They do shut them off when they hit 75, and then when the storm blows through in three or four hours, those get popped right back so on. So theoretically, during a, a tropical storm, it would operate. They peak in tropical storms. They peak perform in tropical storms. It, it's kind of mind-boggling that you can wow. have such a robust machine to take that force but it's the power of nature. And when you can harness the power of nature, we have learned since we've been you know, dabbling with fire, when you harness the power of nature, it is an enormous resource. And that's what's so exciting. Can you imagine this one more thing too, for your, yeah. for your customers, for example. I mean, expensive power. New England's a very expensive place to purchase electricity highest, anyway. Highest right? power cost, highest electricity there cost in the country. There you go. So how about if a company, once they start building these towers, how about if a company went to one of your big, heavy electrical users and said, I can offer you a fixed 20-year contract at 15 cents. That's pretty attractive. You can't and buy that in the spot market. And I actually serve on a steering committee of what's called the South Coast Electric Power Group. Yeah. And we hedge. And part of what we hedge is we purchase fixed products. You bet. You bet. So it's, uh, it's an enormous uh, energy opportunity. Uh, we've used this expression, Saudi Arabia of wind. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not political sort of in the current climate to to use that reference at times, but it's intended to kind of get a point across. Massachusetts is to wind in this area uh, the same way Saudi Arabia is to oil. It's a big, big resource that is right there, right off our coast. Uh, that's very interesting. So Cape Wind took 15 years to not happen. How long are we talking about for the potential of turbines? Yep working off the coast of Massachusetts. Yeah, there was just a very interesting conference uh, and that topic came up uh, just about a month ago in Boston, International Leadership Conference and WIND. And so the prevailing view is that, you know, once the light gets turned on, once the legislation gets enacted, hopefully in 2016, that you would probably see windmills in about three years, four years under construction and five years in place. So. It, uh, so the Haddad bill is critical. The Haddad bill starts it all. So it's the most critical thing going on right now. But we need to also manage expectations. Because once that bill gets passed, that starts the clock. Right. And then it's going to be about a five-year clock. But we need to position ourselves now, as you said, because if you're going to train people for an associate's degree, that's going to take two or three years. That's right. If you're going to build a facility, that's going to take two or three years. So hopefully by, you know, 2020, uh, we have a very robust wind industry in North America, and New Bedford and Fall River are the hub. We've got to do something, because like we already discussed, about 10,000 megawatts are going to go off the grid. Easily, easily. It's predicted to go off the grid. So yes. it's a very scary proposition. If you, like your if you like to put your lights on at night, then you may want to start uh, paying attention to this offshore wind, because it's a, a great long-term solution to a lot of issues. This has been a very interesting half hour. Well, I hope you invite me back because there's so much to say. We, we, we only condensed it in a very yes, short period yes, of time. Yes, I think so. we're definitely going to have to cool. extend I appreciate that. and talk about too about specifically what it can do for the workforce yeah, for sure. going down the road. For sure. Thank, thank you, Thank you for being a guest. Yeah, my pleasure. And thank you for watching and please shop locally whenever you get the opportunity to do so. And we'll catch you in the next segment.